There are at least three people in the world who think about the U.S.-Indonesia relationship 24-7. One is Scott Marcial, one is me, and, <laughs> and today it can be said that it's now official that one is Dino Jalal. During a small dinner in Jakarta with Dino and Rosa 18 months ago, one guest asked me if I had any idea who would be the next Indonesian ambassador to Washington. I looked hard at Dino and I said, I think I'm looking at him. Dino looked behind him. <laughs> Seeing no one, he said, who, me? <laughs> Dino, you can deny that if you want to, all you want. As Kurt said, Dino is the perfect choice for Indonesia to send to Washington. He understands the American mindset, which benefits Indonesian interests and makes it easier for our countries to find areas of common ground. He served previously in Washington and for a record past six years has been President SBY's Special Staff for International Affairs and Presidential Spokesperson. He's been a strong supporter, president, present at the creation of President SBY's initiative of a comprehensive partnership, which we're commemorating here tonight. Dino is an activist who get things done. He's going to increase support for Indonesia on Capitol Hill. His impact will be felt on improving our bilateral educational ties and in all the areas of the comprehensive partnership. Dino has a PhD from the London School of Economics. He's a best-selling author. Last month, President Yudhiyono awarded him the Bintang Jasa Utama, one of Indonesia's highest civilian awards. <laughs> but we're getting not only Dino, we're very fortunate to be receiving Rosa Jalal as well. A talented professional who studied at <clears throat> studied at the University of Indonesia and Columbia University. Rosa, you're the perfect partner to help Dino represent Indonesia in Washington and to carve out your own important role in your many areas of your own personal interest. We welcome you, Rosa. Both individually and as a couple, you and Dino are gonna have a huge impact on the Washington scene. Ladies and gentlemen, let's welcome Ambassador Dino Jalal. Of course, is President Yudhoyono because he's a workaholic who works late into the evening. And second is uh, David Merrill because when it's midnight in Jakarta, it's lunchtime in Washington, D.C. <laughs> We're very honored to have with us tonight uh, Senator Kit Bond and his lovely wife, uh, Linda. Thank you for coming. Senator Bond is a great American and a great friend of Indonesia. And because I want to keep it that way, I will make no jokes about you, Senator. <laughs> I remember when I served it 10 years ago, Indonesia was at low point. But high point or low point, Senator Bond has always stood by Indonesia and kept his faith in us, which is the mark of a true friend. So thank you, Senator, for your steadfast <laughs> My gratitude to Kurt Campbell for being here and for your kind remarks. Uh, last time Kurt was in Jakarta, you told us that you were surprised that your daughters knew more about President Obama's planned visit to Indonesia than yourself uh, because they, they were friends with Sasha and Malia at, uh, at uh, Sidwell, uh, which is why upon my arrival here, I immediately requested a bilateral meeting with Kirk's daughters. <laughs> But Kurt's daughters were not very keen to discuss U.S.-Indonesia relations because, you know, they were very young uh, and apparently they were more keen to discuss more fun issues like uh, the South China Sea territorial disputes. <laughs> I want to introduce my wife, Rosa. Uh, She's a dentist and she's very productive because between 2005 and 2007 she gave birth to three babies. <laughs> and all mine too. Uh, 
we met when I was director for uh, North American Affairs uh, in 2004, I think, yeah? And uh, she was a student looking for a visa to study at New York University. So, thank you, America. <laughs> and yes, she, she did get the visa, but only after she accepted my marriage proposal. I see Sri Mulyani here. Uh, I wish I could make fun of her. I wish I could make fun of her, but my political advisor told me that I really shouldn't take that risk. I see Ed and Aileen Masters, who started this wonderful seed of Yusindo and continue to be its life. You two are simply the best, and I mean it. All right, I got six down and another 300 to go. Uh, today I presented my credentials to President Barack Obama. You know, it was supposed to be a very, uh, you know, very nice uh, event, uh, but I brought my three children, uh, and we had a little bit of diplomatic incidents, which apparently did not uh, turn out to be so. Uh, my son Keanu, he's three years old, uh, four years old, and because of the change of weather, he, he caught a cold. And just as we were, the, the door to the Oval Office was to be open, he said, uh, Dad, can I blow my nose on, 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 on your suit? <laughs> I said, no, you know. And then, and then he asked his mom, can I blow my nose on my mom's suit? He said, my mom's dress. And said, no, you know. And that's when... Uh, I became petrified because the door opened and there was President Obama with his very clean suit. And, and, and Keanu was just running towards him. And I had to stop Keanu uh, and then I uh, presented my credentials. But then the other thing happened, which is when I presented my credentials, my, my three-year-old, uh, Chloe. Uh, Chloe had no idea that, that America is a different country. She thinks America is part of Indonesia. Uh, uh, when I was presenting my credentials, and I swear to God, I, mean, I have photographs uh, to prove this, uh, Chloe was walking, climbing on, on President Obama's desk at the Oval Office and starts walking while I, presenting, I was presenting my credentials. Uh, but President Obama is such a kind, warm uh, uh, man. You know, he he, he knows uh, he's his father, of course. So he knows, uh, and he was uh, laughing at the whole thing. So, so it all turned out to be well. Then there was no diplomatic incident that happened. Today. <laughs> I, I want to thank everybody for coming tonight. I see many old friends, and I wish I could hug all of you and many new faces. And I, I look forward to meeting all of you uh, later on. But. I thank you, Sindo, for organizing this wonderful dinner and welcoming Rosa and I. You made us very welcome, feel very welcome, and I want to thank all of you for your friendship and support as we strengthen ties between our countries. The case for U.S.-Indonesia relations is obvious to you, but perhaps not so obvious to others. Even my old college friend from Bayside, New York, asked me, why should America give a hoot about Indonesia? I told him, after I slapped him a little, <laughs> I told him, you should give a hoot because if you count the things that are dear to America, Indonesia's got plenty of them. America prides itself for being the beacon of democracy, while Indonesia is the third largest democracy in the world. America wants to extend her outreach to the Islamic world. Well, Indonesia has the largest Muslim population in the world. We have more Muslims in Indonesia than in the entire Middle East. America wants to save planet Earth and have clean air. Well, much of the air that you and I breathe now come from Indonesia because we have 30% of the world's tropical rainforest and we've been providing free environmental service to the world and to America. America wants to fight terrorism around the world. Well, Indonesia's counterterrorism effort to capture and neutralize terrorist networks have been an outstanding success. America wants to always be a Pacific power. Well, Indonesia is the largest country and the largest economy in Southeast Asia, the largest archipelago in the world, and with Malaysia and Singapore, we occupy one of the most strategic straits in the world, which is the Straits of Malacca. When there is cooperation between us, there is peace in the region. But Indonesia is also relevant because it is a tricky experiment that works. 
the Indonesian de democratic experiment was full of danger signs when we began it. If we had failed, the consequences were worrying. Collapse of democracy, return of authoritarianism, breakdown of law and order, economic crisis, ethnic warfare, dismemberment of Indonesia, regional instability, and who knows what else. But the Indonesian experiment succeeded. And by doing so, we proved many things. We proved that our democratic experiment can find a happy medium with modernity, with Islam, and as Secretary Clinton points out, with women's rights also. And remarkably, we achieved synergy between all these four elements without bloodshed and without painful soul-searching debate, but rather easily, naturally, and smoothly. And we also proved that we did not have to choose between democracy and development. This was a debate in the 60s and 70s. You now, we achieved robust democratic development with three regular elections in 10 years and peaceful political changeovers. But we also achieved, at the same time, high economic growth, around 6% before the crisis and around 4% during the crisis, which is the third largest among the G20 countries. And don't get me started on how we did it. The fact is that we did it. Not by chance, not by luck, but by always believing that with hard work, ultimately we will get our democracy and our economics right. As Indonesia changes, and as America changes, our relationship must also change. It can no longer be a 20th century Cold War relationship. It must be a forward-looking 21st century G20 world partnership. It can no longer be crisis-driven. It must be opportunity-driven. It can no longer be burdened by mistrust and attention deficit. It must have sufficient comfort level and common interests. It cannot be dominated by hard power. It must be relationships saturated with soft power and smart power. It can no longer drift away without a compass. It must have a clear direction with set objectives and targets and a plan of action to achieve them. And above all, it must be an equal partnership, which is why tomorrow's meeting between Minister Martin Natalagawa and Secretary Hillary Clinton is so important in the first ever joint ministerial forum between our countries. They will provide direction and complete program of cooperation, which will provide substance to this comprehensive partnership that we are trying to build. As we embark on this great U.S.-Indonesia project, allow me to say this to all the stakeholders. Every partnership between husband and wife, between friends, between companies, between nations, every partnership must have soul. And this is also true for U.S.-Indonesia Comprehensive Partnership. In the context of our evolving relationships, finding that soul means both sides must begin to understand that what we mean to one another and how we mean to each other differently this time than we did before. It means that both sides must appreciate that we do have long-term strategic interests in this partnership. Finding that soul means that we become more familiar with one another, able to feel each other's pain. Each has a stake in the success of the other and that we respect each other enough to agree to disagree when we have to.